Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Question number one is not lodged. At question number two, I call Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the Scottish National Investment Bank is operating legally in light of reports that the advisory group that was meant to be established by the Scottish Ministers has not yet been established. Ah. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Now that the bank is fully established and has a growing portfolio of investments, it is the right time for this group to be established. I have already agreed a remit for the group and a short list of potential members. Officials are now contacting individuals with a view to the first meeting of the advisory group taking place this summer. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the bank was established in November 2020, and the legislation says the Scottish ministers must establish and maintain an advisory group to provide them with the advice on the bank's objects, conduct and performance. And from a Freedom of Information request, I have found that the wage bill for the bank has near doubled over the last two years to a whopping £9.7 million. What? So, Cabinet Secretary, how can we have the assurance that the SNP have not created another gravy train yeah. when there is no advisory group in place to monitor the bank's conduct yeah. and performance? Yeah. Always through the Chair. Uh, well, the Member will know that uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank's decisions, individual decisions, uh, are all made entirely uh, independently from uh, the Scottish Government. And uh, the advisory group is to provide advice to ministers. So the group does not have any impact on the bank's existing governance procedures eh, or operational independence. So I wonder if the member is conflating two issues that are actually quite distinct. Holly Coffey. Thank you. A, a core aim of the Scottish National Investment Bank is to make strategic investments to help boost green growth and meet the significant upfront costs of reaching net zero. Could the Cabinet Secretary say any more about how the bank is working to help Scotland decarbonise whilst growing the economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the figures are, are really quite remarkable in terms of uh, the bank's uh, investment. Since its launch in November 2020, it's invested nearly £278 million in supporting businesses and projects which contribute to the shift to net zero. That has levered in a further £555 million of third party capital, bringing the total investment to over £830 million, which I hope is something that can be welcomed across uh, the Chamber. The bank's investments have also generated approximately 2.25 gigawatts of renewable energy. That is the equivalent of powering 610 homes in a year. Question number three, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what it is doing to ensure access to primary care in areas that have a high projected population growth. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Each uh, GP practice's global sum allocation is adjusted every quarter to account for changes in their resident uh, patients list. And, uh, growing practices should receive uh, a greater share of national funding as a result. The Scottish Government annually uplifts uh, general medical services funding specifically to account for population growth. In 2023-24, this amounted to £8.3 million. The Scottish Government has uh, paused uh, capital projects at present due to indicative figures for future year's capital budgets from Westminster, and I am uh, well aware uh, of the particularly acute issues in Mr Beattie's constituency uh, and await the outcome of the cross-government review of infrastructure investment. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Many of my constituents, constituents in areas such as Wallyford and White Craig have raised concerns over access to services due to financial pressures on the local health and social care partnership. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the impact of financial constraints on the capital budget of health boards as a result of cuts to the Scottish Government's own capital budget from Westminster and advise how he will support my constituents to receive the best possible primary care in Midlothian, North and Musselburgh as the population rises? Secretary. Uh, thank you. I thank uh, Colin Beattie for that question. I look forward to meeting him uh, to discuss areas such as this later on this afternoon. Uh, he is right. The UK government did not inflation-proof its capital budget. Uh, based on the latest forecasts, our block grant for capital is expected to reduce in real terms by 8.7 per cent by 2027-28, a cumulative loss of over £1.3 billion. And the result of this cut is that all new health capital projects have been paused. 
Our emphasis uh, for the immediate future will be on addressing backlog maintenance and essential equipment replacement to help improve productivity. Uh, we will also be able to uh, give uh, greater certainty on funding following the review by the Finance Secretary of Infrastructure Investment, which has been carried out. But I am clear that I want to see as many of these projects advance as possible for the continued recovery and improvement of our health services, uh, including in Midlothian, North and Musselburgh. Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Three weeks ago, I asked the Deputy First Minister, who has seized in her place, about the situation in Preston Pans Group practice with regards to the funding. Preston Pans is an area that's experienced significant population growth, with a growing population in the surrounding areas, including blind wells. So can the Cabinet Secretary update me on what's happening and when my constituents and myself will be able to meet with him to discuss these financial cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank uh, Martin Whitfield for uh, raising this point. I'm aware of the situation. Uh, we are in discussions with NHS Lothian around uh, the issues that he raises and have received some assurances around some of the dispute resolution processes that they're looking to put in place. Uh, but I'm very cognisant of the challenge that's been faced by uh, many GP practices as a result. I know that Mr Whitfield has written to me uh, and I'll endeavour to get an appointment in the diary as soon as possible to have that discussion with him. Ben McPherson. The Cabinet Secretary will appreciate that the population of my constituency is growing rapidly and significantly. Uh, to meet new demand for GP practices in the area, in recent years I have raised the possibility of creating a GP surgery at Ocean Terminal in Leith. This would likely be at a lower cost than building new premises in the future, and it has already recently been a very successful vaccination centre. Working with the Health and Social Care Partnership, I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could give this idea further consideration. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I thank the, uh, uh, Ben McPherson for the question. I am acutely aware of the, the pressures that there are uh, on services across Edinburgh, including uh, in Mr McPherson's uh, constituency. And I know that uh, he has raised this on a number of occasions, including with my predecessor. Uh, and I am grateful for his continued efforts in that regard. Uh, it is obviously, as Mr McPherson knows, for uh, NHS Lothian, Edinburgh City Health and Social Care Partnership, to decide uh, whether new GP practices are needed in uh, Mr McPherson's constituency as a result of new developments or whether existing practices can expand. I am also aware that access to services is an acute issue in Mr McPherson's constituency, as it is in Mr Beattie's, as we have just heard, uh, and would support the use in principle of facilities such as Ocean Terminal for new practices, but that decision is ultimately for the Health Board and the partnership to take. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle any inappropriate care and overcrowding in NHS emergency departments. Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. This Government is committed to ensuring the people of Scotland can access NHS services that meet their needs and provide the highest standard of care. Through our whole system urgent and unscheduled care collaborative programme, we are working with health boards to reduce accident emergency delays uh, and deliver sustained improvement. Uh, this includes actions to strengthen arrangements to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions, such as same day emergency care services, utilising hospital at home services that we have funded, and optimising. Uh, uh, flow navigation centres, optimising flow navigation centres. The Centre for Sustainable Delivery continues to support boards to implement changes which will target the key challenges in their systems, such as that that Mr Stewart outlines. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. On an average evening at 10 pm, more than 10 per cent of patients across Scotland's emergency departments are being treated in corridors due to lack of space. <coughs> Worryingly, more than half of all emergency departments surveyed had patients in corridors. Delayed discharge continues to be a concern, Cabinet Secretary. Last year, Shona Robertson said we remain committed to eradicating delayed discharges. So, Cabinet Secretary, one year on, uh, are we any further forward in giving back patients the dignity and respect they deserve? I, I, Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I thank Mr Stewart for uh, his question. And I agree with him that delayed discharge is a major issue. And that is why uh, the First Minister has been engaged uh, alongside COSLA uh, and why I am uh, undertaking a weekly 
uh, CRAG, the Collaborative uh, Response Assurance Group, which is the collaboration between COSLA uh, Health uh, Services, to look at what more can be done, particularly in those pressured areas uh, where performance has not been good enough, in order to see improvements come through. So what are the challenges? What is it that government or the health service can do to support uh, improve the delayed discharge picture? Because that is uh, pr providing the choke, as Mr Stewart has outlined, to the flow through the hospital, from accident emergency into the wards and then back in the community. Uh, and that is something I'm committed uh, to working in partnership with council colleagues in order to see improvements on. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I recognise our hospitals face congestion because of the challenges associated with delayed discharge, due in part to the significant reduction in the workforce delivering care packages in communities due to UK government immigration policy. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that notwithstanding the disastrous impact of Brexit on our health services, Scotland still remains a welcoming place for overseas staff to work and live. Secretary. Uh, in, in spite of the heckles that came from the Tory benches there, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Audrey Nicholl. I think she's absolutely right. Uh, this government values those who choose to, choose to live and work in Scotland from overseas, quite in contrast to uh, what we saw in the debates uh, from those that wish to become Prime Minister last night and in previous terms who are out uh, competing with each other to be uh, uh, toughest uh, on migration. That does not serve the interests of either our economy or our public services. Uh, they make vital contribution uh, to uh, make our workplaces and communities sound. And the UK Government's immigration policy fails to address Scotland's distinct demographic and economic requirements. Uh, therefore, we are pressing for a fair and managed immigration system that meets the needs uh, of uh, the people of Scotland, but also our public services and our economy. Uh, in collaboration with National Education Scotland and COSLA, uh, our Government has provided funding to create centres for workforce supply, social care, to test and develop an ethical and sustainable model of inter national recruitment for adult social care providers uh, in Scotland, and I have already referenced the work that we are doing to try to improve the delayed discharge picture in my answer to Mr Stewart. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its consideration of the impact of the change in subsidised air service provider between Euston and Stornoway on access to services, including health services, for people with reduced mobility. Before I call the Cabinet Secretary, I will just advise members that question number five was withdrawn. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. And I thank Rhoda Grant for this question. I am aware of the difficulties and I have been working with the Transport Secretary uh, to continue to understand the challenges, uh, which is why we are working on possible solutions in collaboration with Carlin and Eileen Shear uh, and NHS uh, Western Isles. I am also keenly aware of the need for solutions to be developed and owned by uh, local partners. I will shortly convene a, a meeting in Uist uh, to support this process, and I know the local MSP. MSP Alistair Allen has also corresponded with me to request this. The Scottish Government is also working closely with NHS Western Isles to ensure that health patients continue to have full access to services. The provision of air services within the Western Isles are a matter for Corlan and Ian Shear to decide, and it is therefore for them to ensure that they have made suitable assessment of impact. However, we will obviously look at what we can do, collaboration between the health portfolio and the transport portfolio, uh, to support them in those endeavours. Rosa Grant. Thank you for that response, and I look forward to receiving an update of the meeting between the Council and the Health Board. But this issue is even more pressing due to the lack of health services available in the US Dunbarra Hospital, many having been pulled back to the Lewis Hospital in Stornoway. Will more services be available locally so those who cannot access the new aeroplane can get health treatments and chemotherapy closer to home? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I thank uh, Rhoda Grant for that question. Of course, I commit to uh, making sure that she is uh, kept up to date. Uh, my understanding around uh, the situation uh, with the US Nabara Hospital, uh, the difficulties there due to clinicians not being able to travel to the site, and the alternative option uh, will be the transfer of services uh, to the Western Isles Hospital and uh, to uh, uh, near me clinics. Uh, obviously, we will continue to work with NHS Western Isles, uh, continue to work with the local authority. Uh, as I have set out, in order to improve the situation uh, for uh, people in the Western Isles. And it is something, uh, as I say, that we are working together on across government as we recognise the challenge that's, uh, that is impacting local residents. Lee MacArthur. 
Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Islander aircraft has been the workhorse of the Lifeline Air Services in Orkney for many years. However, I am seeing growing numbers of constituents with mobility issues in islands like North Ronaldsey that do not have a roll-on, roll-off ferry uh, who are missing hospital appointments or medical appointments uh, due to the inaccessibility of the Islander aircraft. I have spoken to the Cabinet Secretary about these concerns. Can he confirm that he will uh, agree to meet uh, with me, uh, NHS Orkney, Orkney Islands Council, Logan Air and other stakeholders when he is in Orkney? Uh, over the course of the summer so that we can look at finding a resolution to this issue that is only going to get worse given the demographic trends. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 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 Mr MacArthur will be aware uh, that I have a, an awareness of the situation that he outlines, uh, having been uh, both a passenger on the ferries uh, uh, serving the Northern Isles and uh, the inter-island uh, air, air aircraft as well. Uh, I, I have given a commitment to Mr MacArthur to meet with him to discuss this when I am on my family leave uh, in Orkney uh, uh, later in the summer, uh, and I look forward to that discussion and, and see what more we can do to provide the support again on a cross-government uh, basis. Question number seven, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government if it will provide a further update on plans for the redevelopment of Adrossan Harbour. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hitswell. In my response to the motion which was debated in the Scottish Parliament last week on the 20th of June, I confirmed that we have been progressing the Adrossan business case and cost exercise and that this is substantially complete. Uh, Transport Scotland are working with partners to finalise this and any updates on the project will not be until after the pre-election period. Katie Clark. Adrossan has been the main port to Arran for 190 years as it is the shortest, quickest route. Hamza Youssef signed off its redevelopment in 2018, but six years of delays for successive reasons means that ferries will now be running from Troon. Will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that there is a final announcement in July with a plan for the redevelopment of Adrossan Harbour? Cabinet Secretary. So the, mem the member will know, because uh, not just her herself, but Kenneth Gibson as the local MSP and others have repeatedly made the case for a Drossen. I absolutely understand that. But it is absolutely essential to get the investment and the substantial investment that is required that a, a robust business case is set out that meets all the requirements for good decision making. I understand the frustrations not just of the people of Arran but also of Campbellton to get this resolved, but I have been clear and open and will continue to do so and will talk uh, specifically with the uh, partners from the task force as soon as it is practically possible to do so. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is a very undignified public spat taking place between Peel Ports and Calmac at the moment, and this is symptomatic of wider issues and breakdown in relationships between stakeholders across the marine network. Instead of rebuilding berths and ports, this government should be rebuilding relationships within stakeholders. So, can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary is doing herself to intervene in this matter to ensure that stakeholders are working together? for the greater good and for the benefit of Ireland communities. Cabinet Secretary. So, so I take that very seriously indeed, and indeed the success of any development would be uh, with uh, relative partners working collaboratively together. I can reassure him that we had a very constructive task force meeting. I think it was in May, but I'll correct the record in terms of the date. Um, and that, again, was an opportunity for everybody to understand the progress made, uh, the elements that still had to be resolved. And that, I think, is evidence of my personal involvement with the task force to take this project forward. Thank you. Question number eight, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that the provision of midwives by the NHS meets the demand, and I should declare an interest, and in I have a daughter who is a midwife. Sir Jenny Minto. The Scottish Government values every single midwife and the extraordinary care they provide day in and day out. I am aware of the decline in applications to midwifery undergraduate programmes, and this is exa exactly why the education and development of students and staff has been a key work screen of the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force. The task force will report in the autumn and its work will help support the demands this workforce is facing as it works to develop actions to diversify education and training pathways to support longer term workforce sustainability as well as improve workplace culture, practice, flexibility, recruitment and retention. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, last month I attended a Royal College of Midwives event in Parliament where three student midwives shared their experiences with me. 
From the RCM's report and the student evidence, we know that 70 per cent of students incurred additional debt due to their studies and 60 per cent worry that they may need to drop out for financial reasons. This is even more concerning after learning that roughly 45 per cent of those students are over the age of 30. So will the Minister consider looking at an apprenticeship route into midwifery to help the financial issues of mature student midwives in Scotland? Minister. I thank Mr Whittle for his question, and the Chief Midwifery Officer attended that round table that Mr Whittle also attended, and she updated um, everyone in attendance on our plans to review student finance for nursing and midwifery students, as well as review um, uh, of the wider work that is happening with regard to the view. And, um, Absolutely. Um, we are very much considering um, different or alternative career pathways into nursing and midwifery, recognising the growing interest in flexible learning models, which will allow students to earn and learn, and certainly um, apprenticeships as part of that. 